Good morning. Uh, we greet, and there is a certain chill in the air, I would say. Uh, but regardless of the chill in the air, I see some folks that I've known now for 11 years, and so it warms my heart. Now, isn't that a cliche if you ever heard one? Yes, it is. So welcome to worship, uh, especially on a cold day in January. It is ordinary time in the church calendar, and so we also invite those who might be participating in worship with us uh, via Skype, Zoom, any other form that might be there. So greetings and welcome to that world. Let us worship God. If you are able, please stand and join me for the call to worship. Silence your scattered thoughts and lay down your distractions. God calls us here to worship. We are here to worship. Drop your nets and leave your boats. God is with us. Jesus calls us. We are here to worship. Let us worship God together. Let us read the confession responsibly. Jesus calls us, change your hearts and change your lives. Repent and believe the good news. The mercy and forgiveness we have already received enables us to be honest about the places in our lives in need of transformation. Let us confess our sin together. 
God of mercy, and confess that we have settled down in Nineveh. We have gotten comfortable in our categories, have and have not, makers and takers, bigots and bystanders, self-starters and subordinates, law abiders and illegals, the perpetrators and the innocent. We confess that we are comfortable living under the system of injustice and exploitation. We confess our discomfort in speaking truths that unmask the knowledge. Make us ready to follow Jesus, ready to repent, and eager to change the lives of others. Call to us again, show us your wisdom. God desires relationship with us and reconciliation for all of creation. Jesus comes bearing the good news of forgiveness and transformation. Receive the good news of God's grace. We are forgiven. Since, the, since God has forgiven us in Christ, let us forgive one another. The peace of our Lord Jesus Christ be with you. So with you. Please welcome your neighbors, sharing the peace of Christ with them. to us by the power of your Holy Spirit. Enable us to hear your word and embolden us to respond faithfully as we seek to follow Jesus Christ. Amen. The first scripture text for this morning is the 23rd Psalm. I'll be reading from the New Revised Standard Version. The Lord is my shepherd, I shall not want. He makes me to lie down in green pastures. He leads me besides the water. He restores my soul. He leads me in right paths for his namesake. Even though I walk through the darkest valley, I fear no evil, for you are with me. Your rod and your staff, they comfort me. You prepare a table before me in the presence of my enemies. You anoint my head with oil, my cup overflows. Surely goodness and mercy shall follow me all the days of my life. Thank you. 
The second scripture text for this morning, also reading from the New Revised Standard Version, Angelicized, is the first book of Corinthians, chapter 13. If I speak in the tongues of mortals and of angels, but do not have love, I am a noisy gong or a clanging cymbal. And if I have prophetic powers and understand all mercies and all knowledge, and all I have is faith, as to remove mountains but do not have love, I am nothing. If I give away all my possessions and if I hand over my body so that I may boast but do not have love, I gain nothing. Love is patient, love is kind. Love is not envious or boastful or arrogant or rude. It does not insist on its own way. It is not irritable or resentful. It does not rejoice in wrongdoing, but rejoices in the truth. It bears all things, believes all things, hopes all things, endures all things. Love never ends, but as for prophecies, they will come to an end. As for tongues, they will cease. As for knowledge, it will come to an end. For we know only in part, and we prophesy only in part, but when the complete comes, the partial will come to an end. When I was a child, I spoke like a child. I thought like a child. I reasoned like a child. When I became an adult, I put an end to childish ways. For now we see in a mirror dimly, but then we will see face to face. Now if only in part, then I will know fully, even as I have been fully known. And for faith, hope, and love abide these three, and the greatest of these is love. Obviously, we are hearing this morning three uh, very common and critical parts of scripture from the 23rd Psalm, from 1 Corinthians 13, and now from Philippians, this great chapter about Jesus' relationship to God. The Apostle Paul wrote to the people at Philippi these words, please imitate Christ's humility. If then there is any encouragement in Christ, any consolation from love, any sharing in the spirit, any compassion and sympathy, make my joy complete. Be of the same mind, having the same love, being in full accord and of one mind. Do nothing from selfish ambition or conceit, but in humility regard others than better than yourselves. Let each of you look not to your own interests, but to the interests of others. <clears throat> Let the same mind be in you that was in Jesus Christ, who, though he was in the form of God, did not regard equality with God as something to be exploited, but Jesus emptied himself taking on the form of a slave, being born in human likeness, being found in human form, he humbled himself and became obedient to the point of death, even death on the cross. Therefore, God also highly exalted him and gave him the name that is above every name, so that at the name of Jesus every knee should bend in heaven and on earth and under the earth, and every tongue should confess that Jesus Christ is Lord to the glory of God the Father. My friends, the word of the Lord. I am very fortunate to be on very good terms with both of our sons. My first son uh, in the world of music. And for the choir, our 
oldest son began singing his own soprano obligados when he was four. So he is a great lover of music. Likewise, my second son, we have a very good relationship only in a totally different world, in a world of gardening, in the world of mathematics, but mainly in the world of seeking a community. What does it mean, community? Well, I just was talking to that son of mine, the second son, just a couple of weeks ago, and he looked at me straight in the eye and he said, Dad, I think you have completely lost your marbles. <laughs> I said, no, no, Malcolm, I haven't completely lost my marbles, although I will admit that about 20 years ago, I realized there was a hole in the bottom of the bag. <laughs> it's just going and gone. Lost my marbles. Why am I saying that? I'm saying that because next Sunday, if the pastor isn't well enough, and he's doing fine, if he isn't well enough, I'll be back, and I know exactly what I want to say next Sunday. I never preach the same sermon twice, but I know exactly what I want to say next Sunday, and the theme of the sermon is going to be the fate of meeting God face to face. Now, I've worked that out in pretty intense detail, but this morning, well, I did begin losing my marbles in 2006, and that's why I retired early. I didn't feel like I was any longer capable of that sharp, precise kind of sermonizing that I like to do. And so this morning I thought I would give to you an example of what I mean by having lost most of my marbles. <laughs> Abraham Lincoln. On the news of hearing that Mrs. Bixby had lost five sons in the Civil War, it was a wrong thing. He hadn't, she hadn't lost four. Five was harmed. But he wrote to Mrs. Bixby a letter. And it's a letter that I've read again and again since 1962. My very first speech I had to make when I joined the FBI uh, was before a group of people. And I used this letter back then in 1962, so I remember it well. Lincoln wrote to Mrs. Bixby, there are no words that can be used to assuage your grief. When we are confronted with extraordinary tragedy, for those of us who want to be consoling to that soul, there are no words. The only response in the face of tragedy and the pain and the grief and the loss are the ears listening. Listening. About 15 years ago, a rabbi, Krishner, got a diagnosis that his son was going to die very soon and have a very short life, and he did. Kirchner wrote a book called When Bad Things Happen to Good People. You're welcome to read the book. I recommend it, though I don't like the book. I don't like the title, and I don't like the conclusion. But a lot of people do. It sold 11 million copies. It's been translated into dozens of languages. So you may find it helpful. I personally did not. And here's why. When bad things happen to good people. Think about that title. It's a lousy title. You think because you're good, you shouldn't have something tragic happen to you? That's baloney. It's hogwash. Bad things happen to everybody. Before you die, you're going to experience horrible tragedies. The minute you fall in love, right? The minute you fall in love, you realize, in the end, tragedy is going to happen because you're going to lose that person that you love so much. So with the birth of love is the birth of tragedy. It's an intertwined relationship that is inescapable. In fact, there was a, well, I'll talk about that in a minute. I want to give you a better answer. 
Just a few years ago, the ordinary character we know as Hunter Biden, who has all kinds of griefs and problems, not including lawsuits, Hunter Biden asked his dad, Dad, why are these bad things happening to me? And Joe Biden's response to his son was perfect. Why not you? Right? Why not you? What do you think so special about you that you shouldn't have bad things happen to you? You see, Biden was spot on. I was in the ministry for 42 years, and I'm almost 80 years old. And I've seen tragic things happen to good people, bad people. And right now, as my wife will tell you, my heart is breaking because my very favorite student at the College of Worcester in her mid-30s may or may not live much longer from cancer. Brilliant student. Graduate with honors in physics and in German literature and language. Gorgeous person. Tragedy has struck that family. Why? Why? Why tragedy? I've probably read every book, magazine article, news article, and documentary on why. So, now, I'll be very careful. There are some of you here who probably believe that even though you do not know in your own infinitude why you believe that God has an ultimate purpose in tragedy. If you believe that, I want to encourage you in that belief. Personally, I don't buy it. Tragedy just happens. There is no why. Second, another thing that occurs when tragedy happens is we want to know who, who's responsible for this mess? Who's guilty? Who should be ashamed? You did it. Well, in America today, 50% of marriages end in divorce. If you have a tragedy in your family, that divorce rate goes up to 80%. And why is that? Because in the tragedy itself, people want to find reasons, whys, and who's to blame. And that kind of conflict erupts within a family, and the marriage doesn't make it another 30% of the time. Another answer to tragedy is, why? Who's to blame? A third one is, well, if tragedy just happens, then life is meaningless. And I can tell you, in, in 1960. Eight. I wrote my major paper in college on the subject of tragedy and meaninglessness and nothingness after Friedrich Nietzsche, who was the ultimate philosopher on the theme of meaninglessness life. And if you want to see that, re see the movie Das Boot. Fantastic. And I remember the song I used by the Strawberry Alarm Clock. Anybody here remember the Strawberry Alarm Clock? Oh, come Oh, yes. Thank you, Martin. And the line goes like this. Who cares the things we choose? There's little to gain and nothing to lose. Or as Peggy Lee sang in 1969, if that's all there is to life, then just keep on dancing. So there was a milieu, a whole cultural movement in the 1960s of Friedrich Nietzsche's nothingness. So we have one response, why? A second response, who's to blame? And a third response, it's meaningless. Now, why do we do that? Why do we look at those bad answers? Because, because tragedy is just too hard to deal with. So instead of dealing with the tragedy, we ask ourselves the question, oh God, why'd you do this to me? Or Jack, you were responsible for this mess, or well, let's just why don't we just jump in the river and drown? Instead of dealing with the emotional grief and pain that's there. And it can be absolutely devastating. One of our responses to that, if we are abnormal, is to want to somehow fix it in a consoling world. And I come from a family that couldn't stand other people's tragedy. Just couldn't deal with it. 
Uh, my father, who experienced horrible tragedies in his 20s, uh, drove him nuts. So he never really recovered his sanity uh, as an adult, so I lived with a crazy father. What do I mean by that? Well, we moved off our farm because the log home we lived in was caving in. Couldn't live there. So we moved over to my grandmother's house when she, uh, her, my grandfather died and she moved away, so we moved into the house. Well, Thanksgiving, get this, it's Thanksgiving morning, 1952, 53. We're all preparing for Thanksgiving, and my dad went over to the old farm to check on the family. Well, thank you very much, Dad. He came home. Now, the only vehicle we had was a big lumber truck. So Dad came home, unbeknownst to what we were thinking, fixing the turkey. He went down the basement. He got a clothes basket. He got a wooden box. He got a couple other boxes. He called my sister Jane and my brother Bob. He said, Come down here. So they went down, they got boxes and baskets, came upstairs. My dad took all the food off the dining room table. He took all the food out of the refrigerator, got my brother and sister to take it out to the logging truck, and he took it over to the farm and gave it to the folks over there. He said, well, they didn't have anything. True story. That's only one of many. Those stories go on forever in my household. When my older brother turned 19, he got himself a car. It was a, I think a 48 Dodge with Continental on the back. Remember those old cars, Continental on the back? And my brother had it for about three weeks when my dad saw a fellow who lived down the road with three kids and no wife. My dad saw him walking up the road with the three kids. He was going to town three miles away to the grocery store. My brother said, Bob, get the keys to the car. Okay, my brother got, Bob, take those keys out and give them to that man and give him your card. You don't need it, he does. So my brother did exactly what my dad said. He got the car keys, his beautiful Dodge with the Continental on the back, and gave it to the guy. My dad said, Bob, you don't need that car. You got a lumber truck to drive if you need it. I can tell you lots of stories like that about my childhood. One response is physicality. Year after that, we had only two African-American families live within miles of my home. One man's barn burned down. Now, we were a poor family in itself, but his barn burned down. What did my dad do? Took the lumber truck, went down to the mill, got some guys down there, loaded the lumber truck, drove it over. No, he dumped it. Came back home, loaded it again, went back over, dumped it. My dad delivered enough lumber that the man rebuilt his barn. Never sent a bill, just said, enjoy it. That's my family growing up. Physical things. As a child at our church, I remember people going from family to family. They made candy in other people's homes. The worst about physicality and taking care. I remember my mother giving permanence to women in our house because they didn't go to salons. Do you know what a permanent smells like in your kitchen? It's miserable, miserable. Christmas time, we had a stairwell going up to the attic. Our stairwell from the dining room to the attic would be full of cookies and candy from Thanksgiving on to Christmas. And during the Christmas season, it was all given away. Now, what about physicality? I want to be very precise about this. Physicality, helping in tragedy, is simply a means to something else. What was it a means to? It was a means to conversation. In my community, if there was a siren, everybody knew who was in the ambulance. If there was a siren, Everybody knew who was in the ambulance. Why? Because they all did each other's hair in the kitchen. Because they made candy from Thanksgiving to Christmas time. Because they walked with each other to church. They all knew each other. So physicality was simply a means of building a relationship to talk about the pains and griefs of tragedy. Now I want to talk for a minute now and, and sit down because I'm always way too windy. I want to talk about the blue zone. Any of you here know about the blue zone yet? 
A little. I'm going to pick on you, Steve. Now, uh, where did Jim go? Oh, there he is. He's back there. Steve is a lazy bugger. He's lazy. He's a lazy dude. Not no hope for him. I'm telling you, no hope. I've been going to this community meal project, see? I get there. I'm passing out biscuits or something. What's he doing? Have you ever seen him pass out biscuits? Have you ever seen him give away a hamburger? What's that bugger do? He sits at a table and asks people, how are you doing? Let me do that again. He sits at the table and asks, how are you doing? I want to hear your story. Tell me about your life. Who are you? I like you. You're a good person. It's good to see you. Tell me about your troubles. That's what I'm here for. That is a ministry. It's a ministry that this church does so well. I deliberately, since I've been here, have not called on people. I have made two calls in my ministry since I've been here in 11 years. I had the privilege of visiting with Mr. Gable one time and then twice. That's it. I don't call on people. It's the minister's job, not mine. I don't do that anymore. But I do know that a lot of people did call. I do know that people do care. So let's do a list of what's called the blue zone. What is it? A group of sociologists, environmentalists, and other professional paleontologists and all that kind of stuff have visited communities around the world and stayed for a long time. And they have documented what it is in their environment where people live to be over 100. So they visited several places around the world where people live a long life. And those are called blue zones. Now what is and what classifies a blue zone? And this is what my second son is so intensely looking for. And I mean seriously, he's looking for that place. One, people cook meals together. Isn't that crazy? People cook meals together, home-cooked meals in each other's homes. People walk to places together. People sing together. People listen to one another. They're a whole gift of learning how to listen. People tell stories. It's a blue zone. My goodness. So uh, I've decided to do something. When Larry was here, I never talked to him. Two, three years he was here, I was never, never spoke to him, never went to his house, never had lunch, zip. Going out the door, I said, goodbye, Larry. Uh, when when uh, David uh, O was here, I never talked to him one time. We had pizza, talked about the ovens at the restaurant. When Liz came, didn't talk to her much either. When Diane came, I pestered her a little bit but now Jeff's here. Uh, he's in serious trouble because I'm going to, in fact, I've already badgered him once. Uh, and I'm just going to continue badgering him. And why is that? Because this guy is solid as a rock of Gibraltar. He can say no. Do you actually he told me no about something? <laughs> Think of that. Think of that. And then, I heard his Christmas Eve sermon. It was a powerhouse. And then I listened to his prayers. This guy's a dark horse that's going to win the race, so I'm going to badger him. So here's number one badger. Do you know how many families there are in Logan that's a one-parent family? Drive around the city 
do the statistics and find out the answer to that question. So I said to Jeff, I said, Jeff, this is, he was here about a week. I was already badgering. I said, Jeff, I want to do a, start a ministry. Will you do it? No. Uh, Jeff, he said, give me three months. So here it is. We have this school program here, the, don't we? We have a great preschool program. Why don't we build on that as a program for single parents? Uh, as a congregation, we meet one night. All of us gather one night, and uh, parents can bring, uh, single parents bring their kids here. We'll watch them. Have the parent go home and clean the house or something. Or one day a week, sell all kinds of stuff we do. That's one. But now back to the blue zone. I, I would charge all of you in the next three months to Google the Blue Zone and then make a list of everything this church does that qualifies as a Blue Zone. And what is that? Now listen, what kills people? Stress, too much of it. The Blue Zone is a place where people can relate to one another their traumas their tragedies, and their lives. And we do that. We have Steve asking people about their life. We have people visiting shut-ins. We have people visiting those who have dementia in their families. All kinds of things. So I'm, I'm challenging you to look at the blue zones on Google. Study it. And then begin to think, how can we increase our capacity for having conversations with people about their lives. And that's the blue zone. Now, I had another 15 minutes, but cancel that. <laughs> it's wonderful to be here. I'm glad to be here. And uh, one more little tiny item. Some of you know David Brooks, the famous op-ed writer for the New York Times. And you know that David came here. About two, three months ago, he came here and made a major presentation. Phenomenal speech. I went. I thought I was going to hear about politics. I didn't. Let me, let me do this because it's important. David Brooks has a new mission and ministry, if you get this. Now, this is David Brooks we're talking about, some local yokel. David Brooks has a new mission and ministry. David Brooks says the number one problem in America is loneliness and isolation. And he has now taken it upon himself to dedicate his life to writing and finding ways to help people build relationships. That's all this sermon is about. David Brooks, The Blue Zone. Amen. Tenors, if you can sing tenor, the third line of this hymn. It was 1870 to 1890, Russia was encroaching into Finland. Tremendous hostilities between Finland and Russia, and Finland, of course, was overwhelmed. So they had what they called their covert celebration of Finnish patriotism. And they did it in such a way that the Russians wouldn't be too upset. As a part of that celebration, Sibelius, the great symphony composer, wrote a symphony, and it was called Finlandia. We, of course, sing it as a hymn. Well, in that symphony, which I just listened to again this week, in that symphony there's a great melody, wonderful melodic thing that's called the song we sing. Now, it's done all on flutes. It's a gorgeous piece. Well, as you know, I'm deaf as a doorknob, but I've asked Susan if she would play the introduction to this four-part hymn. It's almost like a Bach chorale. If she would play this, on the flutes. So she's registered the organ to be flutes. Now, I don't know what the registration is going to be. I presume she'll go back to a normal registration after that. Uh, but I want you to hear it as it would be heard if you were sitting in the Great Symphony Hall in Finland listening to Sibelius' uh, great work. So let's uh, stand and sing the hymn.
You may be seated. <clears throat> it was in the uh, fall of 1969, and uh, I had the privilege, and it really was a privilege, of uh, visiting the home, Charles West, of the main writer of the Confession of 1967. He was a great guy, professor of theology, wrote some extraordinary books at the time, and uh, I just happened to be in the community where he was, and he invited me for uh, tea and coffee or something. This has always been my favorite section of the Confession of 1967. It's a wonderful text, and uh, hopefully you in your own time over the course of time, we'll take time to read it again and again. From section B of the Confession of 1967, read with me, God's sovereign love is a mystery beyond the reach of the human mind. Human thought ascribes to God superlatives of power, wisdom, and goodness. But God reveals love in Jesus Christ by showing power in the form of a servant, wisdom in the folly of the cross, and goodness in receiving sinful souls, the power of God's love in Christ to transform the world discloses that the Redeemer is the Lord and Creator who made all things to serve the purpose of God's love. God has created the world of space and time to be the sphere of God's dealings with humanity. In its beauty and vastness, sublimity and awfulness, order and disorder, the world reflects to the eye of faith the majesty and mystery of its creator. God has created us in a personal relation with himself so that we may respond to the love of the creator. We were created male and female, and given a life which proceeds from birth to death in a succession of generations and in a wide complex of social relations. We are endowed with capacities to make the world serve our needs and to enjoy its good things. Life is a gift to be received with gratitude and a task to be pursued with courage. We are free to seek our life within the purpose of God, to develop and protect the resources of nature for the common welfare, to work for justice and peace in society, and in other ways to use our creative powers for the fulfillment of human life. Great, great statement of faith. Here's the end of it. My wife is gone so I can tell this quick. My, uh, <clears throat> my youngest brother, uh, was I was eight when he was born. It was 1952. And uh, my father finally relented. Uh, we bought our first TV, 1952. It was wonderful. And uh, we enjoyed that. My brother was born on October the 4th. And we enjoyed that TV. Uh, October, November, and I got to watch the Lone Ranger and Champion and all those people and cartoons on Saturday. And well, my dad went to the farm again. <laughs> he went over to that farm again and he looked around. And by this time, there's electricity. I mean, I, there was no electricity or running water when I was there, no indoor plumbing. So he goes to the farm and he came home on Christmas morning from being at the farm and again he called my oldest brother and <laughs> he, he, my oldest brother was 18 my next brother he, <laughs> he was 13 he called him upstairs the boys come up here <laughs> and for the only time in my entire life did I hear my mother and father have an argument because my Dad said to Bob, Bob and Bill, boys, pick up that television and get it out to the truck. It's going to the farm. <laughs> I was eight. I'll never forget that. My mother said, Herman, if that TV goes to the farm, 
I'm going with it. <laughs> well, that, that's just little, little pericopes in, into my life as a kid. There's a point to that story. There are people today who do not have a television. And there are people today who do not have Thanksgiving. And as I drive around the city of Logan, I realize that more and more. God has given us many gifts. The gift of music, the gift of teaching, the gift of being a good business person, the gift of love, the gift of music. But for most of us, we've had a gift of financial security. And so let us give as God has given to us. pray. Wondrous God, for all the gifts that you've given to us in this world, we pray that these tokens of our love and affection to the world, and in thanksgiving to you, will be a blessing. For we pray it in Jesus' name. Amen. You may be seated. Where's your place? Where's your place? Where is your place that you go? If there was a tragedy occur, where would you go to be alone and to pray? Where would you go? Would you go to the ocean and sit at a bench? Would you go to the mountains and sit up there on the top of a mountain? Would you go into the kitchen and drink a cup of coffee? Would you go visit a friend? Where would you go? I would go down, 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 far down into the woods where there's a spring somewhere, like David in the 23rd Psalm. So I invite you now to go to your place as we pray together. Wondrous God, you give us these holy places, sanctuaries of the soul, sanctuaries of the heart, sanctuaries of our spirit. And so here we are in our place. 
We open our hearts and minds and souls to you. We ask you to enter into our space as you allow us to enter into your space on holy ground. And so, God, receive our prayers, our prayers for Jeff and Joan, our prayers for this world, our prayers for our family and friends, our prayers for this church, our prayers for joy, our prayers for comedians, our prayers for emissaries, our prayers for psychiatrists and psychologists, our prayers for chefs and cooks, our prayers for teachers, our prayers for people in high political places, our prayers for those in prison, our prayers for those in hospitals, our prayers for those who have lost their identities to some misery they can't outgrow. Hear our prayer as we pray the prayer that Jesus taught us to say. Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread. Give us our debts as we forgive our debtors. And lead us not to temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom and the power, and the glory forever. Amen. Him is six hundred twenty three. My first charge to you, of course, is be sure to stay for a snack because I bake the chocolate cake and the snickerdoodles myself. They're wonderful, I guarantee it. And when I first came here 11 years ago, one of your church members greeted me downstairs and he said, I'm glad you're here. I only come for the coffee hour. It's the best part of the day. Uh, so uh, you're, you're invited to do that. There's all kinds of goodies down there. 
And now I charge you, as the Apostle Paul wrote in almost all seven of his letters, that we are to go out into the world as peacekeepers, holding on only to those things that are good, never returning to anyone evil for evil. Rather, we're to strengthen the faint-hearted, bind up the broken-hearted, carry, literally carry the weak. And in so doing, the God who created us, the God who continuously picks us up when we have fallen, that God will be with you now and forevermore. Amen. Amen.